Hello. Hi, welcome to another uh, program of Tuzame. Hi, which Cinti. means Biyahad, which, which means, means together, 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 togetherness, togetherness. togetherness. Hi, Tilly. Yes. Uh, there is a sun outside, which is wonderful. And that today we are going to talk with Yara Kedar, and Tilly will introduce you. Just to say that we are here because we would like to uh, widen our horizon about different subjects and Yara Kedar. Tilly, would you please introduce our guest? Yara Kedar, um, histo fashion historian, fashion uh, curator between Tel Aviv and New York. Uh, hi, Yara. Hi, how are you? And let just, I just want to add that she graduated from NYU. She, she graduated from Shankar, the fashion NYU, school in Israel, right. and then NYU in New York, and now she's working on her PhD. PhD right, yeah. and she was also, in Jerusalem. she also worked in the Metropolitan Museum. She will tell us, she will, will get Yeah, there. but I just want to make sure to not slip. <laughs> no, 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 we'll get to the Met, don't okay. worry, don't worry. <laughs> Too many stairs though, but we'll get I to know. the Met. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see how many stairs they took in the tomorrow? And I mean, sorry, yesterday when, you know, it was uh, when Biden was uh, the, sworn, there were so many steps, unbelievable. Yeah. Anyway. Just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the sight of the flags, God, the American flag, there's no flag like the American flag, I have to say. It's really uh, a dynamite brand of America, this Absolutely. flag. No right. country has Star spangled, yes. It's just unbelievable. And we can mention if there are also fashion designers who used it. Always, always, mm -hmm. this is especially Ralph Lauren, you know, we know. Okay. Um, okay, so let's start. Yara, fashion, Corona, where are we standing with this? Yeah, I think initially everyone thought that Corona and fashion don't work, but then I think something really interesting happened when fashion designers started to look into um, loungewear, and sweatpants and sportswear um, in a different, you know, from a different angle. Um, sportswear is something that has been developing um, rapidly in the ten in the last ten years, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, there's this term that kind of um, um, became really popular: athleisure, uh, which is a mixture of um, athletics and, and leisure. So you look like you're going to the gym, but actually you're going to just have coffee with a friend. Um, but it became even more prominent um, since the pandemic um, because people want to look good even if they're home. And even if they're wearing sweatpants, you know, no one said sweatpants couldn't be a designer sweatpants, um, which is something that existed. But I think... Um, it became um, like the staples of the, you know, casual wear in general. So you, you start seeing more and more casual wear outside and on the streets right now. But is it for men and women? Because when I say men, I always see buttons, you know, mm. button shields. Yeah. So is it anything, any change with men? Um, I, I see men wearing um, matching suits and um, track suits. And um, this is something really popular right now, like wearing matching sets of uh, sweatshirts and sweatpants and also with the zippers. And like there are more colors, more patterns. Um, things are evolving. But I can say from what I know, um, from fashion, I mean, from Israeli fashion designers that people are still buying things that are not necessarily worn like at home. Um, I am, I have a good friend who is the owner of Daniela Lehavi, the um, luxury leather goods brand. And he said that people are buying shoes and like beautiful shoes, like, you know, not just casual shoes, um, that are comfortable, but they're not necessarily just to be at home. What does it um, tell you? What does it tell you that they buy those shoes, although they're not really using them, maybe? That the fashion, fashion is crucial to, fashion is crucial um, to maintain morale and to keep hopes up and to buy something, um, you know, a, a, from an optimistic thought that you would wear it 
someday for like a really nice event. And one day, you know, they'll open the museums and we'll go to openings. And one day there will be weddings. And I would want to have these shoes, you know, as soon as they open. Um, and yeah, I think this is something that kind of maintains optimism. But some people, uh, fashion freaks, they not always buy to use it. They buy to mm -hmm. have it. And they create their own little gallery in their closet just to enjoy because they must have something. I think we saw it a lot in Sex in the City. They must mm -hmm. have it. And, uh, and it's interesting to compare it to girls, which I admire, especially yes. what's her name, Anna? What is the main character in Girls, but not? Ah, girl. uh, Hannah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it was really interesting, the, the distinction between the two right. clients. Because mm -hmm. some people think that fashion has to be practical some people think that uh, uh, fashion has to be a fantasy that you need to follow and some people don't understand what's the big deal and some people <laughs> go crazy with this and they it's a bit pathetic uh, there's room for everybody and the truth is that it's fun you know it's really a lot of fun but, but you know I think I, I, I keep telling people you know the story of, of that my mother used to tell me that back in Tel Aviv after women came from the Holocaust, especially women from Hungary, Romania, um, they didn't have uh, nothing, but they always uh, bought lipstick. Tipi's know? mom had the, one of the first cosmetic stores in the center of Tel Aviv. Yes, mm. so well, Dizengoff. Basically, everybody from Tel Aviv and the outskirts of Tel Aviv landed in her store because all the buses stopped at the, at the door right. of her store. So she she carried her way with all the women everywhere. Yes. But you know, but she, she tried to explain me how sometimes the basics of life, something that gives you joy, even in, when it's really bleak or difficult, you have, to, like she said, people has to, they had to smile at off it. I mean, you cannot go without smiling, even a you know, tiny smile. But she said they really had to buy things to make them happy like lipstick, like, uh, you know, once in a while they went to the market to, to look for a dress, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I, so I know what you're talking about. Is I think in America it's much stronger because I remember when I had, L I went to um, fertility treatments and I remember that after one of the treatments, the doctor tell, told me, now you can go shopping. I said, what it has to do with shopping? He said, I don't know. All the girls are going shopping, right? Straight from here. I said, I don't need to shop. I need to get pregnant. He said, I have no <laughs> clue. You just go and do what you want. Yeah. I didn't go to shop after I, I was pregnant because I thought that after I'm, I would deliver a baby, I will get taller. I don't know why. <laughs> that something will change really big and I will get taller. And when it didn't happen, I didn't buy anything. <laughs> I mean, what, the same size, you know, the, the <laughs> tall midget size, you know, it's, it's crazy. But Not anyway, so what, the birds and the bees. Yeah, so what are, you, uh, are we trying to tell through our clothes? The way, and is it what we would like to be? Is it connecting to who we are? Do we can, what we think people expect from us? What, what story do we tell? Uh, I don't know, is it the alternative biography we create? What is it? It's, I, I would need an hour to answer that because the, the you All know, the, 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 answer, and the, the answer is so wide because fashion really casts the widest cultural um, um, net that I can think of because fashion holds within it history and future and escapism and heritage and status and wealth and wealth that you don't own or have necessarily or something that you aspire to be um, it, fashion is political um, it can um, you know it, it it can kind of express messages hidden messages messages about feminism and 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 race and and gender and equality and inequality and you have everything in fashion right? And, and sometimes it's not even an, um, a conscious statement. Sometimes, sometimes you wear something without, without even really being aware of um, its history, but it's so rooted in, in, in history or in the you know, 
cultural consciousness that it just it's just there but when you start going back and and you see where it came from or the origins or you know the fact what you were saying about your mother and lipstick lipstick is really a symbol of um it's lip gloss right the people that don't know it they know what is a lipstick of course yeah. they all know what lip not everybody knows okay what lipstick is. sorry I uh, my my personal Zoom accessory is right here. Yeah, yeah, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course, um, it's it's really a, a a symbol of overcoming crises, um, and it's it's also like a, a known um, fact in in finance that women are buying more lipstick when um, when times are hard, during wars, during you know pandemics lipstick um, sales rise. I'm not sure what the numbers would say um, during the corona because so many people are wearing um, yes. masks. Um, but I do know and I do see that many, many women are, you know, very preoccupied with, you know, the right shade for them. And also, I think that since since the corona, we're all Zooming and we're all FaceTiming all the time. All that people see about us is this part. And this part is glasses, lipstick, nails, you know, sometimes a little bit Nail. of jewelry. Um, yeah, it's it's very important. Um, and it's it's interesting. Um, there was an Italian born um, fashion designer, Elsa Scaparelli. And when she started designing in the 30s in Paris, she said that she was always um, putting all her efforts and focus on the waist up because women were not so mobile. They were mainly sitting in restaurants and cafes and, and you would see them from the waist up. So everything would always be, you know, very Office. embellished. Yeah. yeah on the it's top really, part. Yeah. And it's such an interesting um, way to think about how women's status um, and role in society is sometimes expressed through fashion. But don't you think that it's all statement because whether you're aware of it and you direct it or you ignore it, even when you ignore it, it's a statement because it's a part of a social statement because it's part of a big society that uh, they tell them how to evolve, you know, from fashion wise. So hmm. I think it's all statement. You belong to some... Some I agree, but most pe some people are really not aware of it, or they say that they're not aware of it. There's this famous scene in um, The Devil Wears Prada, um, you know, where she kind of, she, she's being attacked for saying that she's not really interested in what's going on in fashion. And, you know, the, the Anna Wintour in the film is explaining her how everything is connected and how all colors are connected to fashion. And you can't just wear something and say, I'm not a part of it. You're always a part of it because you're wearing it. Absolutely. So what happened to Adam and Eve? This is really the start of fashion, right? I agree. Yeah, I, I what, just what um, gave did? a lecture on the history of aprons. And um, according to um, the story, they were actually wearing aprons because they, they were wearing belts with leaves. And this is like the beginning of... Mm -hmm. um, of aprons, of the most basic um, piece of garment. What happened is, you know, they became conscious and, and they wanted to hide something. And I think that if you think about fashion, it always kind of, what I love about fashion is that it sometimes reveals and sometimes it conceals. And this is like a really interesting play that happens when you when you are a part of fashion and you, you you get dressed you know i have a student i'm teaching a documentary class and she made a, docu a short documentary because she is the i don't know how you say it today big woman you don't say fat woman right she says fat plus size is right. the but she calls herself she said she, so she did a short documentary about fat women mm -hmm. and the attitudes toward fat women and how they're trying to hide all the time and they're not successful um, so, so, do you know, do you remember the name of the documentary? She's just doing it for my class. It's oh, an okay. exercise. It's, it's an homework. exercise, but actually, it will be a mm -hmm. documentary. She's very devoted okay. to it. 
Uh, but, but, but she was talking a lot about what we are trying, to, how it's for them, it's so important to hide and they're not successful. And uh, she's really bitter and frustrated. Rightfully uh, so, so, because fashion, the fashion world ignored um, women who were not the standard size, whatever this, there is no such thing as standard size because everyone is different. And what we know from history, I, um, I co-curated an exhibition back at NYU on my, um, in the costume studies program um, that focused on the history of plus size in, in fashion. Yeah. But, but it was called know, beyond asking, measure. But hmm? ask, you know, you look back at paintings, Renoir, um, but this was another Modigliani, I mean, even before, <laughs> look, throughout history, women came in all sizes, even, <laughs> you know, if you go back a thousand, you know, thousands of years, women came in different sizes. The thing is that fashion, the fashion industry ignored women who were not in the standard. But also the beauty I, uh, ideal changes over the years and uh some things we are lucky that we are in these days and some things we are not you know when i was uh when i was growing up it was very hard to find clothes for uh, tall people in tel aviv it was yeah very- i'm sure when i even when i was in the army i got a, a special permission to get pens from a boutique outside, you know, from the uniform mm-hmm. section because there was no way. And when I was pregnant, I remember I walked into a maternity store across from my house. And as soon as I crossed the, I just started. As soon as I crossed the door, she said, I have nothing, nothing. for you, even for now, forget about later. <laughs> and that's it because they had all size six with a belly. So it's really, and if you start bigger than then 10, 12, 14, But you know, couldn't. so yeah, what easier. is the difference between a, a fashion designer and a stylist? And also, if you have to style me or Tzili, <laughs> what are you looking at? So, and what is the difference um, between fashion designer and stylist? First of all, I'm not a stylist, so this is not something I would do. I would send you to someone who's, you know, best at, at their work. Um, you know I would say because we stopped dealing with design and we crossed into styling and it, mm-hmm. it's a very thick line. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say that a designer, like classically, you would say that a, a designer is the one who would make the clothes and create the vision. Um, but I have to say that many designers today are not really... Yeah. designing and they are not creating visions and this is something that even before the pandemic there was a crisis in fashion because really? so many designers were you know they were too busy with just you know moving forward and fashion true. became yeah. so fast um, and fashion houses demand designers to become um, celebrities and like to have millions of followers on Instagram and and this really, Um, in many cases has nothing to do with design. Um, a stylist is the one who would kind of take everything to create um, an outfit and would give it life and attitude and personality. And sauna and, specific to a specific person to, be, to cross all the lines. Yeah, exactly. And so a stylist would also be involved with hair, makeup, accessories, and like how everything is becoming um, a, a persona, like you said, and an ensemble, I would say. Um, but it's true that today many designers are, you know, more, you know, they're busy doing styling rather than designing and doing other things that kind of demand how sales are moving forward. And you know, making perfumes and and you know, yeah. um, well, eyeglasses and things that sell. And they have somehow to. It's not to, accessible. Uh, but you know, there's um, there are few worlds that mingle together because across the 80s and the 90s, women designers uh, created for working women, especially in the United States. So it changed the whole attitude. And then slowly, slowly, they passed, they crossed lines like the evening wear 
came to visit the day where the day word somehow got into the evening wear and they mishmashed it all together <laughs> still try to define enough so they don't lose the economic side of the whole mm -hmm. thing so many things had changed yeah, but i'm time. really upset you know in the oscar ceremonies movies are not important anymore you just who is yes. your designer and you know and they ask you everything is fresh everything yeah. about that but let me ask you something so how come the small black dress stayed didn't go away is or did it go i don't know <laughs> um the little black black dress as chanel said is the the ford of the fashion world like um the um classic black simple lines it was made of jersey when she created her um, little back black dress, she is sometimes credited for inventing the little black dress, but Chanel did not invent the little wow. black dress, but she popularized it and she gave it a twist, which was using the jersey fabric, which was stretchy. It was mostly used for um, sportswear until she started using it. And the, so this was comfortable and this was modern and the simple lines were um, on par with what women, modern women in the 1920s uh, were looking for. And they were looking for freedom and comfort and class and fashion. Um, and I think, Zili, you mentioned the, the 1980s and it reminded me of our exhibition, the yeah. exhibition that you showed in your gallery and, and I curated from um, Gaetan's found collection in the street. It was um, a collection of almost 10,000 slides wow. um, of fashion shows that took place um, in the 80s and 90s in New York. And many of them coincidentally were taking place um, in, in, the bil in your building. Yeah, and the story, let's just go back a little bit to the story because it's an amazing story. Uh, it is. I have uh, the building and I have the gallery, Zaz 10 Times Square, and Gatan, an old friend of mine who is designing maquettes for a big place. Um, mm -hmm. she likes maquettes are like the small scale small models scale. of uh, set design. And um, she always liked to collect things that nobody needed and read about things that nobody knows. And she, she <laughs> found in the street boxes and boxes of slides of uh, fashion that basically were belonged to a reporter from Tokyo that her son took the photos and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she wrote to Tokyo about what was going on in New York. And then she came to visit me one day and she said, let's see what you did with the gallery. And she said, maybe you would know what I should do with this. I have it for 10 years, all the slides at home and I don't know what to do with this. And I said, listen, part of these designers were in this building and the, the photos were taken in the showrooms in these buildings. And I called Yara from the street and I said, Yara, will you do it? She said, absolutely. <laughs> and then we dug <laughs> into the whole thing and it came out like an amazing, uh, yeah, amazing, amazing show. Amazing. Well, but you know, amazing. I looked at the I, I must admit, and when I looked at it, my question is always, uh, you know, how, to what extent do I have to uh, feel comfortable with my, you know, the fashion I, I choose? Like, for example, I know that you did also a fantastic exhibition about Ronit al Kabatz, the famous, Israeli. unbelievable Israeli actress who unfortunately passed away too young and so talented. But she used to talk about what's clothed is for her. Mm -hmm. I, don't know if you know what I think you know comfort was not real really a question they were wearing um you know if you choose to wear high heels that's your choice as long as no one is forcing it on you it's wonderful and Ronit el Kabetz chose to um project something to the world on screen she would portray women on the edges yes. um yeah. Women in prostitution, women who are fighting for their freedom, women who are really in the periphery of everything. But on the red carpet, she would don the most beautiful couture gowns. Comfort was not a matter of it. She was um, completely so free, but she, felt she, was, she looked so free. 
Absolutely. And, and I think it's, it's really the definition of feminism. As long as you are the one to choose, if you're wearing a corset, then it's great. If you are the one to choose that you're wearing high heels and not your boss who says you can't come to work wearing flats, it's great. If, you're, if you choose to wear makeup or not to wear makeup or to, to wear a bra or not to wear a bra, as long as it's your choice, it's, it's wonderful and it's beautiful. And um, it what reminded me of the exhibition, Tilly, was um, my conversation with Nili Lotan. Nili was the designer for, um, vice president of design, I think, for um, Liz Claiborne. And what she said, said about Liz Claiborne and that was so revolutionary is that they were offering clothes for the working women and they were offering clothes um, in, in sets. So you could buy five, six items that would go together. You don't need a stylist because Liz Claiborne says that it works together right. and you can, and she said that um, sales were booming because women didn't want to be a part of like, what do I wear? How do I match it? They didn't, they were so new to fashion that they would just buy wow. the entire outfit and they would wear it as it is. Yeah, because and men don't also have to about, about it. You go, men go to right. a, whatever black tie, which you didn't know. Exactly. Tilly didn't know what is a black tie when she got married. But she married <laughs> this American and he asked people to come with black tie, to, sorry to tell your story. Well, no. <laughs> to, for a wedding and she he didn't she didn't know what he's you talking know about. we got married in tel aviv and and leon said uh, let's let's write black tie and i said what do you mean black tie nobody knows what black tie is in israel and he said yes but i have it doesn't exist abroad and we need to respect them i said but we don't know let's write down on the in, uh, invitation a proper appearance and then mm -hmm. they'll call my mom to ask her what does it mean and she will tell don't come with sandals and that's what <laughs> happened everybody yeah. called my mom and she said just please don't come with sandals so <laughs> everything would be yeah. correct but then when he passed away and we went to the funeral I forgot and I had many people coming with me from New York because we buried him in Israel and they've never been in a funeral in Israel and I forgot to tell them and they all showed up with suits and ties and I said so guys hot. please take it off put your jeans and t-shirt because first of all it's extremely hot and and then it's inappropriate you know it's so weird <laughs> Not right. like in New York, yeah. we're in shock. I think, I think the entire idea of a dress code is um, almost no, non-existent in Israel. And I remember that one of my first experiences in New York, we were invited to a wedding, like a really fancy wedding. And there was the, the cocktail the day before. And they said um, cocktail attire or something like that. I and I was wearing like a beautiful... I didn't know, but I thought, you know, cocktail, something nice, but not too, you know, right. but I came with like a maxi gown, but I was the only no, one no. wearing a maxi dress. The next day was the wedding. And I said, all right, I'm not going to wear a maxi dress. I'll wear like a, a mini, you know, dress. And, and I came and one. everyone were wearing gowns and I was like, oh, I'll never get that. I want to ask about the rules and the laws because in mm -hmm. the United States, the rules and the laws of uh, getting dressed are so vivid and so clear. And um, it's, it's very hard to stay in the rules, especially for people like me that cannot stand rules and laws. And, <laughs> and I don't have even stuff and, for the law. You need you to know. break it all the time and find the way to somehow not to hurt anybody's feeling, but still stay on your own. Yeah. What is it that really uh, people need so many rules and laws in order to know what to do, when to do, why to do? I have to say, I never really got it when, you know, in except the fact that it's very good for business. New York, um, I was never able to figure it out. I just think it has a lot to do with history. And I think it's it's connected to the fact that You know, America has history, has a sartorial history, which is something Israel doesn't have. It's something that, you know, is what is going on in Europe for centuries. But in Israel, we just started in 1948. And, and you know, people, you know, when, when Israel was established, you know, Ben-Gurion wanted everyone to look the same to kind of avoid the 
differences, the background differences. So everyone were wearing khakis and, you know, and, and, and temple hats. <laughs> and it was like the, the def- like the triangle hat that uh, was so much part of the Israeli symbolism. Yeah, um, a few years ago, there was an exhibition um, in the MoMA Museum um, that was called Items, yes. um, is fashion modern. And I knew the, uh, one of the curators of the exhibition, and she said, you know, maybe we can put an item that comes from Israel. What defines modernism in Israel? Um, because they were working on a list of 99 items. Um, on that list were blue jeans, white t-shirt, the Burberry trench coat. Right. And I said, I think the temple hat is right. a modern symbol of, of Israel. And I'm really proud to say that MoMA now has in their permanent collection, they have wow. a temple hat of Atta. <laughs> <laughs> and it was on the show explaining that tembel means um, a dummy hat. <laughs> and, you know, it was a really funny thing to, to do. But this is like a crucial difference between Israel and America. Right. Send me something. Can we extend your generosity and ask you almost like bullet points, almost like a kangaroo jump? Just give us the main uh, pivotal moments of fashion, you know, uh, like, I don't know if Since it's Renaissance. When? let's say since the renaissance or <laughs> the church if you could it just you know just to mention so we can carry it with us and maybe look into it a little bit more or if i, I think most this, fashion I historians <laughs> i think most fashion historians um see the moment or the birth of of fashion as we know it they see it as a european um phenomena that evolved um in the middle ages And it has to do, to do a lot with, um, you know, commercialization, um, trade, evolution of cities, and the fact that there were many people who were not um, royalty or um, religious um, elite. And they had to express um, what their, you know, status in society is. Um, I would say, you know, I would kind of take us um, further into Versailles, the 18th century, 17th century, with um, Louis XIV kind of declaring fashion as a part of the identity of France and the way he would reestablish France as the leader of the world through the use of fashion. It was regulated. Um, and it was like almost um, um, manufactured to convey a political statement. Um, I would take us further in time into the 19th century and the Industrial Revolution um, and the invention of the sewing machine and um, standard sizing and um, how fashion kind of started moving forward faster and faster. Um, and then, 1920s, um, the fashion revolution of, of women kind of starting to discover what freedom is. It was not really, I would say it was pseudo freedom because there was such a long way to go. And even when they were allowed to vote, um, it was only white women. And so this is something we need to remember. Um, and, and even though during uh, World War I, they were able to work because they needed to replace men who were working in the front, um, you know, after, and it also happened during World War II. Once World War II was over, they were kind of automatically sent back to the kitchen to, you know, reproduce, make uh, and bake and, and stay at home. And we see those things in fashion. It's really reflected through fashion. And then I would go, further to the 60s and the use of new materials like denim and plastic and and vinyl mm -hmm. and um and then in the 80s which was something that we focused so much on silly is the fact that this is a time when women are really becoming um a, an important part of society and culture and they were starting to um handle more managerial 
positions and right. they had to express it and they had to wear pantsuits and they had to wear things and that would say, you know, I'm not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think now is a really interesting time because um, there's variety. You can be, um, you can be the boss, but you can wear pink and you can wear heels yeah. and you don't have to wear like a padded shoulder right. um, suit to be a really strong woman. Um, and you can be plus size and you'll find many, many outfits that would be right. perfect for you. And you can wear makeup in your shade because we need to remember that makeup and also hosiery, oh, um, you know, that. pantyhose were always like nude color and, and there was not a variety of shades and colors and, and, you know, treatments. And so I, you know, one of the questions I always get is, if you could go back in time, which period would you go to? And I always say that I would not go back in time. I would never travel in time to, you know, anywhere but this um, era in which I think things are the best, especially for us as women. women. Yeah. I just want to tell you one little anecdote. When my boys were three or four, I was driving and they were sitting in the back with their uh, nanny and mm -hmm. the early hour nanny is from Trinidad. She was sitting in between them and I'm looking at the mirror all the time and they were looking for things in her purse and they were playing and all of, and both my boys were very, very, very uh, white and blonde. And all of a sudden I see them with, with dark, dark, dark cheeks because they took her makeup and they were just painting all over their faces and it was so funny but it was really great because the colored women had their makeup uh i think that uh, other other colors and other body shapes were able more to to really mm -hmm. enjoy the variety yeah Yara, can you maybe share with us your website because yara is giving amazing lectures about <laughs> all of them and i think it's really pretty not to uh, to join. Yeah, yeah. No? yeah that's the... Uh... So people know and they can, uh, they can join because it's really pity not to. Uh, thank you. I think my name is showing on, on the screen. Do, can you see my name? Y-A-A-R-A-K-E-D-A-R so dot com. Yep. Yeah, this is great. But it's the most simple are... thing. Um, and all, all my lectures, my anyone. upcoming lectures are there. Because I'm a bit ignorant, uh, can you talk a little bit about those famous, I don't know, singers, artists who took so much from fashion and became so, it, it, it's flamboyant, but it's still with so much vision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would definitely name David Bowie as, as the leader, leader of um, both a revolution, but an an invention, an invention in in fashion, and um, he was really um, a genius, and he knew um, long before other musicians and artists knew how to utilize fashion um, to create their persona, to distinguish themselves, um, to express messages, to um, also get attention to succeed, which is also something really important. PR is a very important thing. And I would, the way he worked and the way he kept, he had, he has had an archive of um, over, you know, hundreds of objects that he collected, including costumes, um, very similar to um, other famous examples like Frida Kahlo, um, who also kept her her collection and understood uh, that there's value into there's artistic value for the objects that she's um, working with and working with to create her persona. She kept her clothes, her makeup. Um, she used to, you know, um, use um, brown pencils to make her eyebrows darker, and um, she kept everything. And Ronit El Kabetz, interestingly enough, was um, worked in a very similar way. She, you know, she worked for almost 40 years. She moved her boxes from small apartments to small apartments, but she kept everything. She kept um, costumes from um, um, 
um, theater shows that she uh, played in, 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 in the early 90s, um, I, I found so many beautiful objects. And, and also what was interesting about Ornit is that um, many pieces were wrapped in like um, silk paper and she left notes that she, and, and this is like decades before she knew she was sick. So it's not something she did only like to prepare something for us. She knew that there's value into the archival work of, um, of her collection. So some dresses said, you know, this is by Alembica, this is by Gideon Obelzon for the Oscars of 1997. Yeah. And these are all Israeli designers. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, I had a conversation with Sofia Coppola, who is mm -hmm. really a fantastic film director. Yeah. And she said that she looks all the time every magazine she can put her hand and she picks up images not just from fashion but just a home design furnitures and she take them in and she she bring them again for whenever she decide what will be the visual architecture of her film mm -hmm. it's extremely i would love to see How an exhibition about. an exhibition on uh, on her would be incredible yes but you know, I started also now to, to look at magazines because I think it's a fantastic way yeah. to, to fill your head with images that you maybe mm -hmm. will not, you know, you'll not be exposed to and they're so inspiring actually. It's true. But yeah, let's go back a little bit to the Metropolitan Museum. Oh, sure. We, everything changed from uh, costume shows, we elevated it to art shows. How did it happen? I remember the first one with Alexander McQueen, which was mm -hmm. out of this world. McQueen was not the, the first fashion exhibition at the Met, but um, it was a game changer in the history yeah. of, of fashion exhibitions because there were exhibitions, they were smaller, um, their budget was tighter. Um, I think Alexander the McQueen- The presentation was very different. Yes, absolutely. It was stunning. It was, it, it created these, these like the haunted spaces, um, architecture, music, it was a spectacle. And exhibitions up until then, most of them did not look like that. Um, and fashion, I think, enables exactly that, to create a fantasy, to create something that is larger than life. Um, and and it, it, it involves so many of our senses um, and this is, I think, a part, a major part of the success of, of that exhibition that um, broke the record of visitors of, of course, fashion exhibitions um, at the Met. It, uh, I think there were um, over 660,000 visitors um, and it became one of the most visited exhibitions in the history of the Met. Um, and within a couple of years, fashion exhibitions became the most visited exhibitions um, of the Met. Um, China Through the Looking Glass brought over 800,000 visitors. Um, and the record breaking was um, um, Heavenly Bodies. Heavenly Bodies, which was dedicated, they called it Fashion and the Catholic Imagination, brought to the museum um, 1, 650, thousand visitors. So they get and, a stamp to legitimize actually that fashion is actually a part of art form, right? Absolutely. And and yeah. not everyone likes it and not all art curators would approve of so it. They saw the Met Gala a bit reducing the seriousness. But it's part of uh, social life today. But Yara, we're almost at the end and it's almost a year after the, the old fashion way before the Corona of fashion shows. It was an end of an era. How we're we going to go back to something? <laughs> what's what's, what's, what's going forward. on now? Because uh -huh. there are all kinds of ways that big designers are finding ways to show, which makes it much more interesting. Can you, do you want to talk about it a little bit to take? Yeah, I think it's, it's a lesson in, um, rethinking how we work, how we buy, how we wear things. I think people are starting to appreciate more um, quality 
rather than buying fast and buying a lot and well, it's um, <laughs> yeah the the sales of of secondhand luxury is booming because people are co collecting and they really are appreciating things that um do not necessarily require more manufacturing more materials um I think we will see a lot of technology taking place in the future of fashion, um, like digital printing, 3D um, printing, um, creating on demand rather than creating like uh, produced fashion market in the retail market to reuse, um, to repurpose, to recycle. All these things are really important right now in, in the fashion. And um, Celia, I know that you love that um, um, video by Alexander McQueen, uh, the house of McQueen, um, which is led by Sarah Burton. Um, their latest collection, they created a, a beautiful five minute video um, that kind of shows the vision of the house for the coming year, but I think also in general, because what they did um, is that they only used fabrics that they already had. So they did not buy anything. They did not ma manufacture anything. They only repurposed um, existing uh, materials. And I think it was so smart. And this is really where the world should go to because we need to look at what we already own and mm -hmm. what we already have and be happy with it. And I think it's a really beautiful message. I think reuse is a big thing and it's important to understand that it's fine and you can do it in your own closet and you can change things from one thing to another and do it everywhere. It's maybe um, not great for business, but I think it's a healthy process to uh, recover. No, it's also protecting the, you know, the air, the, the land, the water. Yeah. The, Absolutely. Everything. Yeah. And I think yeah. young people are very conscious about it. They're also, by the way, conscious is where the clothes are produced, like not in sweatshops. You know, they're really young, young yeah. generation are very much aware yeah. of all those issues of social and, uh, you know. And climate, and, every, yeah, absolutely. And I wonderful. hope with the new era in the USA as well, um, we'll see change. Yara, we need to let you go to your son. <laughs> Thank you so much. We miss you. My pleasure. And, I miss you. And for a safer continuation of everything. And I hope and you enjoyed health. it as much as we did. I did. Thank you for that, Suzaman. Suzaman. Thank you, everybody. Bye, and we Ruby. will be here next week. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you.